Hey everyone and welcome to The Year Was, the podcast all about today that gives you just enough information to effectively be that guy at the party, causing all your friends to question. Hey, who invited you? Like, seriously, why are you here? I'm your host Michael Montalvo, for the next few minutes we will swim through the river of time to find out what makes it a truly unique. On this episode we examine the events that occurred... May 6th. According to airships.net, Count Ferdinand von Zeppelin began construction on his first airship, the LZ-1, June of 1898. The LZ-1 was constructed and housed in a wooden hangar on the water of Lake Constance in southern Germany. The floating shed was important because it allowed the ship to be positioned into the wind in order to enter or leave its hangar. By the winter of the following year, the LZ-1 was complete, but it was decided by Zeppelin to wait until summer of 1900 to actually attempt a flight. In June of 1900, two years after construction began, hydrogen filled the ship's 399,000 cubic feet of rubberized cotton fabric, and it eventually made its maiden voyage July 2, 1900. Much like the Wright brothers, he flew his airship only a short distance for a short time this being the respectable time and distance of 18 minutes and three and a half miles. For this voyage, two gondolas were suspended below the ship, and each one was home to a four-cylinder water-cooled gasoline engine. The pitch, or the vertical direction, was controlled by a sliding weight under the hull. From here, only improvements could be made to the design. The LZ-2, built in 1905, incorporated triangular girders that improved rigidity and strength, while the LZ-3 and LZ-4 increased controllability, power, speed, range, and payload. The large horizontal fins and elevators provided greater pitch control and the capability of producing aerodynamic lift. So now, they had the power for longer and more reliable flights, and in 1907, LZ-3 made a flight of 8 hours, and then in 1908, LZ-4 made a flight of 12 hours on July 1st. Zeppelins now had the public's attention, and the government began to promise financial support on the condition that an endurance flight of 24 hours be made. And so on August 4th, 1908, that's just what they set out to do. But due to a sudden storm on August 5th, they were forced to make an emergency landing that caused the ship to crash in a fiery explosion. But they didn't lose faith in Zeppelin's work, and the public rallied behind his efforts. The Germans gave 6 million marks for the construction of a new ship and breathed new life into the Enterprise. During World War I, moderate success was made with long-range bombing missions using Zeppelins, and on two occasions, in 1917, they made flights of almost 100 hours. It was actually these performances that led many to believe the airships would be a prominent part in aviation. Okay, I'm going to do a little bit of a time jump here. That last bit was just to give you some background information. By the 1930s, despite the Great Depression, Zeppelins were being used for transportation. The idea of intercontinental passenger transportation was too difficult to really give up on. Originally, LZ-128 was going to be the airship in question to make this happen, but then tragedy occurred. The British airship R-101 crashed and the passengers and crew were all killed in a hydrogen fire. The Zeppelin company decided to alter their plans and develop a ship that would be lifted with helium. Helium in comparison to hydrogen, is much heavier. It also provides less lift, so the ship that was designed had to be made larger so that it would carry the same payload. The LZ-128 was abandoned, and the 7 million cubic foot LZ-129 was born. And I'm sure you can see where this is headed. LZ-129, or as it came to be known as the Hindenburg, was 803.8 feet long, had a diameter of 135.1 feet, and a total gas capacity of 7,062,000 cubic feet. To this day, the Hindenburg and its sister ship, LZ-130, are the largest objects to ever fly. Construction began in the fall of 1931, but it wouldn't be until March 4, 1936, that it would take flight. 
Some of the luxuries one could experience on board were on deck A, a promenade and lounge where passengers could view scenery as well as listen to a, a specially made baby grand piano that was constructed of aluminum and covered in yellow pigskin. The passenger cabins were also on deck A and were very similar to that of a train cabin. However, the walls, in order to keep the weight down, were made of foam and fabric. On deck B, the kitchen and crew's mess was placed, as well as a smoking room, which contained the only lighter allowed on board, which was built into the room, and was pretty brave of them, considering the flammability of hydrogen gas. I know what you're thinking. It was designed for helium, so why was it filled with hydrogen? Because of export restrictions between the United States and Nazi Germany, there was simply not enough helium to fill the Hindenburg, and so because of this, hydrogen was used. So it's March 4th, 1936, and after a few test flights, Dr. Joseph Goebbels ordered the Hindenburg to accompany the Graf Zeppelin to fly over any German city with more than 100,000 people and drop Nazi propaganda. It wasn't until May 6th, 1936, that the Hindenburg made its first scheduled transatlantic flight from Europe to the USA. The Hindenburg carried 1,002 passengers on 10 scheduled trips. And then... In 1937, during its first North American flight, something happened. The year was 1937, and on this day, May 6, the Hindenburg burst into flames during landing, killing 36 of the 97 people on board. Here's what happened. The trip was called pleasant and smooth, despite headwinds that delayed the ship and pushed back its arrival until 6 p.m. By 3 p.m., the Hindenburg was over New York City. It continued to fly south and arrived at a naval station in Lakehurst, New Jersey, around 4.15. Poor weather conditions at the field concerned Captain Max Pruss, as well as Lakehurst Commanding Officer Charles Rosendahl, who sent recommendations to the ship to delay landing until conditions improved. Pruss departed Lakehurst and flew over the beaches of New Jersey until 6 p.m. when they had sufficiently waited out the storm, and conditions improved. He then received a weather report that he saw as acceptable, and at 6.22, Rosendahl messaged a recommendation to land now, and at 7.08, strongly recommended the ship to land at its earliest possible landing. Shortly after 7 p.m., Hindenburg approached the field from the southwest. The wind was coming from the east, and so a wide turn left was made to fly a descending pattern around the north and west to line up a landing into the wind from the east. They began to valve hydrogen, in order to reduce buoyancy for landing. As the turn continued, the tail end of the ship was heavy, so they valved more hydrogen from the bow, but this, however, failed to level the ship. First Officer Albert Samant then ordered three drops of water ballast. You can actually see this in the video of the disaster, which I'll link in the description. When this did not work, crewmen were ordered to add their weight to the bow. It was then that the wind shifted to the northeast, but Hindenburg which was close to the landing area, did not have a lot of room to maneuver. Pruss decided to execute an S-turn to change the ship's landing direction so they could line up for a landing into the wind. At 7.21 p.m., the landing ropes were dropped. Minutes later, R.H. Ward, who was in charge of the port bow landing party, noticed a wave-like fluttering of the outer cover. He would testify that it appeared as if gas were pushing against the cover. At 7.25 p.m., the first visible flames appeared. Several witnesses inside the ship saw the beginnings of a fire. The fire quickly spread and engulfed the tail of the ship, and the Hindenburg began to sink, nose towards the sky. The fire actually spread so quick that the ship was consumed in less than a minute. Passengers inside were thrown around and pinned against walls by objects and other people. Some of them jumped out of the promenade windows in order to escape the burning ship, but the majority of those on deck A survived. The ship settled to the ground in less than 30 seconds, and in the video, you can see it all collapse onto itself. Navy sailors ran into the wreckage to rescue survivors. Crew members on deck B were mostly trapped. The ship settled to the ground in less than 30 seconds, and in the video, you can see it collapse onto itself. Navy sailors ran to the wreckage to rescue survivors, and on the newsreel, you can hear the announcer yell out through tears, Oh, the humanity. When it was finally over, 62 survived the crash, although many suffered injury. 13 of the 36 passengers, 22 of the 61-man crew, and one member of the civilian landing party 
died as a result of the crash. Despite many previous airship disasters over its 35-year history, the Hindenburg marked the end for passenger zeppelins. So, what happened? Experts theorized that the sharp S-turn ordered by Pruss overstressed the ship, causing a bracing wire to snap and slash a gas cell. This would have allowed the hydrogen to mix with the air to form a highly explosive combination. The official cause is attributed to a discharge of atmospheric electricity that, when it met with the gas leak, caused the explosion. It has also been suggested that the disaster may have been a result of anti-Nazi sabotage. The first flight was essentially a Nazi propaganda mission. Speaking of Nazis, you guys remember that scene in Last Crusade when Indy and Dr. Jones are trying to escape Germany, and so they get onto a Zeppelin? And then when the Nazi shows up, Indy throws the guy out the window as passengers look on horrified, and he goes, No ticket! That's a pretty great scene. And that's going to do it for us today. If you like this podcast and want to hear more, give us a rate and a review. That helps me out and helps steer this in a direction that is hopefully good for all. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can find the audio version on your podcast app of choice. You can find me on social media and at YouTube at the Apple Cider Club. And as always, I want to thank the Tim Kreitz Band for our musical theme. And to thank you for listening. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.